So we have come to the point in time where something that was repeatedly discussed over the years has now started to become intrusive in our daily lives. And now that I see how far they are willing to take this thing, this is something that will never be dropped and it will continue to dramatically affect our lives. So we have to accept and share the truth. And I can tell you, they're not going to like me doing this. But what I would like to do is take a time out to take a closer look at something the elite and media have been trying to demonize for years. And that is a simple molecule known as carbon dioxide. You know, early on, years ago, when they first started talking about this, I thought to myself, they'll never be able to get that narrative to stick. We already know about carbon dioxide and its functions. How are they going to trick everyone into believing that it's threatening the planet? Boom, here we are, 2021, and look what's happening. What? You mean to tell me that people around the globe just let these guys ride with this cockamamie theory and now it's affecting our daily lives. How did they do that? Well, one, they did it with the media, and two, they did it with laws. That is the main reason we are now living in a world dealing with con bid. Because whatever they say, people believe just because they say it, right? This is one of the things that I try to stress on this show, and that is the importance of due diligence. Because without it, we are definitely living in a great delusion. Now, carbon dioxide is a chemical compound composed of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms bonded together. It has a melting point of negative 55.6 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of negative 78.5 degrees Celsius and has a density of 1.977 grams per milliliter. It is an important greenhouse gas that traps heat in the atmosphere, but it is a minor component of the molecules that make up air. Nitrogen and oxygen make up the air mostly. 99% of dry air is nitrogen and oxygen. These are permanent gases because we are living in a space where you have a volume of air that fits in the amount of space allowed. We only have a certain amount of space to hold gases. Of the permanent gases, there is nitrogen, oxygen, 99%, and in that leftover 1%, you have argon, neon, helium, hydrogen, xenon. Those are all permanent gases, by the way. Then also within that 1%, you have some water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, some dust particles and chlorofluorocarbons. Now, when you hear that the CO2 levels are too high, when they talk about the percentage in a specific volume of air, they are going to represent it in parts per million, ppm. They'll say something like, actually, I'll pull the source for you. CO2levels.org. According to this, CO2 levels in 1950 were around 310.5 parts per million. And as of November 8, 2021, it is 414.96 parts per million. And the reason they use parts per million when presenting that to you 
is because the number sounds big. If you want the percentage, you have to take that parts per million and multiply it by 0 0.0001. So from 1950, it's 0.03105%, and increased to 0.04. 1496 for a total increase of 0.010446%. So CO2 levels from 1950 have increased 0.01%. If I round that off, it has increased 0.01% over the past 70 plus years. So after hearing this, wouldn't you agree that due to the fact that all gases in the atmosphere change over time, why are they focusing in on one gas that has a 0.01% change that took 70 years to occur? And that little change is causing all these issues with the planet. Also, keep in mind that not all the world's atmosphere is created equal. And what I mean is, if you live in New York, is the atmosphere in New York the same as the atmosphere in California? Is the atmosphere in California the same as the atmosphere in La Palma where that volcano erupted? Is the atmosphere in these different places the same? No. Where did they take this measurement? Because I guarantee you if you measured the volume of CO2 in the air in Mexico, it's not going to be the same volume of CO2 in Antarctica. So what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the CO2 levels in general. In general, what general? Different places have different atmospheric conditions. They are BSing you. They think that you were born yesterday. That you know absolutely nothing about CO2 or the atmosphere. And they also think that you can't do math because understand this out of that 0.01% increase humans are only responsible for about a quarter of that percentage the government will say things like oh humans put out 35 billion metric tons of CO2 in 2019 without telling you how much CO2 was already in the air because we are talking about 5.5 quadrillion tons of air so it's about 400 billion tons of co2 that exist in the air already and i just explained to you all that the 0.01 percent increase that we contributed to but by saying humans put 35 billion metric tons in the atmosphere they make it sound a lot more than what it is you see, folks, let me be clear, and I am sure many of you feel the same way. I am against pollution, of course. I believe in cleaning up after ourselves and keeping the planet clean. But what they are doing is trying to pin the changing climate on us for another agenda altogether. What is that agenda, you ask? To suck the life out of us, of course. You know... I was recently turned on to something that they have in the works, and this is called CCS technology, carbon capturing and sequestration technology. And what they do is they capture CO2 before it gets into the atmosphere. They take that CO2 and compress it into a liquid, and then they permanently inject that liquid CO2 a mile underground beneath thick rock layers where they say it will dissolve and mineralize over time. Not only does that sound like not a good idea, they are going to actively reduce photosynthesis in plant life by sucking CO2 out of the air, which means less food for everyone. Animals have to eat too, by the way. I want to show you guys how they trick everyone. Are you ready? Here we go. As CO2 levels rise, rice becomes less nutritious. 
New findings raise public health concerns in poor nations where rice is a major dietary staple. The results of a major study published yesterday in Science Advances suggest that rice, a crucial food source for billions of people, is less nutritious when grown under higher carbon dioxide concentrations. Its stores of protein, iron, zinc, and some important B vitamins all decline. That's a potential concern for public health, the authors say, particularly in poorer nations where rice makes up a large proportion of people's diet. Now I want you guys to understand that this is true. And they want to convince you that the argument of increased CO2 helps plants, they want you to get your mind away from that. But, and you can look at several articles about this, they didn't tell you the whole truth. They didn't tell you that the reason the rice came out less nutritious is because they didn't balance the nutrients in the soil with the new levels of CO2. They just added CO2 without changing anything else. They think you guys are fools. Really. Here's the thing. The rice plant grows bigger because of the increase in CO2, right? But the nutrients in the soil stay the same. So now you have a bigger plant absorbing whatever is in the ground. So yeah, of course it's going to appear to be less nutritious by volume. They're very clever, you see, but not that clever. I figured this out just from a few pieces of information they themselves provided. They want you to think that the polar ice caps melt because the CO2 and gas emissions, but they always, always leave stuff out. The heat that is up in the Arctic doesn't come from rising CO2 levels. It comes from the equator. Look up thermal hailing circulation. Do you see, there's a lot more to this than just rising CO2 levels. Machine learning reveals links between atmospheric pressure patterns and Arctic sea ice melt. As the Arctic Ocean's sea ice cover continues to decrease, scientists have been working to better understand what drives sea ice loss to improve predictions of seasonal changes in sea ice, a new study supported by CPO's Climate Variability and Predictability Program, led by Cyrus and the University of Colorado Boulder uses maps built with machine learning to identify large-scale atmospheric patterns that are linked with the start of seasonal sea ice melt in the Arctic. Then it says, early sea ice melt is often triggered by increased radiation associated with increased levels of moisture in the atmosphere. There is no mention of CO2 in this article. Understand, they will just make stuff up. Did you know that? And they can do this as a result of not elucidating the facts. It's not on me to do that. It's on them, since they are the ones imposing policies on people. They are the ones having expensive summits to convince the world we have a problem. They want to actively remove CO2 from the air, and it may be an agenda to starve vegetation, therefore starving us. What happens when plants don't get enough CO2? Do they become weak? Small? Brown, maybe? The point of all this is, they can't really do anything about it. What's happening to the planet is happening whether we are here or not. And putting 35 billion tons of CO2 or taking out 35 billion tons of CO2 a year ain't going to make nothing but a 0.01% difference. There is more to come, folks, more to explore. Be sure to visit woodwardentertainment.com and the Woodward Entertainment Store. You can follow me on Instagram at jwoodward. And until next time, everyone, be sure to stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.